few words about myself, just quickly. Uh, I'm writing software for 25 years, started in, in, in school. And uh, for about 15 years, I was managing a team, different teams, up to 120 people sometimes of developers in Ukraine mostly. And uh, I'm also a Java developer myself, a project manager, and uh, an owner of a company who was you know, managing all these people. Um, you can see my Twitter account, you can see my blog, please subscribe, That's, that will be interesting because everything I'm going to say today is explained in my blog and many different articles. So I'm going to present you the way we manage programmers, the way we manage projects, and it's quite different from everything you've seen in, many other, in all other places. So that's why you definitely will be interested to, to, to see more content from me. Here's the subject, here's the problem. So in all my projects, for many, many years, I had the same as these people are saying about the industry in general. So all our projects, all the software development we have is basically a chaos. So we, we fail, we, we, we slip the, the, the schedule, we miss time, we don't complete the requirements, we don't deliver, we spend money, and customers are not happy. I've had that for 15 years in all, in most of our projects. And I found that statistics in the report which says we're in chaos and they say that about like 94, which is, which is almost 100 per percent of projects actually fail and have to restart. That's what the report says about the entire industry. And they say that only 7% of that projects fail because of technical incompetence. So, they, so the problem is not with programmers, the problem is with the management. They fail because we miss requirements, because we don't understand what to do, because we cannot control what we do, because we cannot manage ourselves. It's not because we're bad programmers, not because we don't know Java or Ruby or whatever. It's because we don't manage ourselves the right way. And I had the same. So that's why I tried to solve the problem and invented the methodology, which, is, uh, which actually, in my case, in my experience, in our projects, actually helped us a lot to, to, to resolve that and, and be successful. There are five things. The, the methodology is quite big, but there are five things I want to highlight today, and, and they're quite controversial, that's why it's interesting. So five things, how we are different from everything you've seen before. Thing number one, traditionally, we believe, traditionally you believe or they believe, that the teamwork is so important for the success of the project. We think that it's so important to, to, to keep the team together, to make sure that people stay together, that they are motivated to work together. And the job of the manager is to make sure there's a team there, make sure that the people match to each other, and, that's the, and, and, and this, is the, the, this is the key factor for the success of this team, for the success of the project. So we just, we just spend a lot of time on, on the team building, on team spirit, on making sure that people love each other, and that's how we guarantee the success. I think that this approach is for lazy managers. This is for people who cannot understand how to manage programmers. This is for people who are not really managers. This is what causes troubles in projects. This is what, this is what uh, leads to loss of, of the A players. Do you know what A players, B player, and C player is? This is the terminology from the sales, actually. But I think it, it can be applied to programming as well. So there, in any team, we have A players, B players, and C players, like senior programmers, medium programmers, and junior programmers. So A players, they're always you know, aiming for excellence. So they're always trying to do better. And C players are the people who we kind of have to remove from the team. So this approach with the teamwork, in our experience, is really good for C players and it's really good for lazy managers. In our case, we do the opposite. We aim for individual responsibility, not team responsibility, but individual responsibility always. So we don't like the idea of the team in general. We always pay attention to who is doing what, what's the personal scope of the task, and we scope that task individually. So we always assign tasks individually to programmers. We always give tasks to, uh, we always control the results of each programmer individually. So we never, we don't, we don't do the team work at all. So we clearly define the rules on the, of, of, of the work. And this is a lot of job we do on the, on the management side. Uh, we always have an architect in our team, which is who is the person who is responsible, personally responsible for the success of the project, and who is making all technical decisions. So we don't have any democracy in our teams. We don't vote for technical decisions. It's always the architects who makes the decisions, and always the team, the players or developers, who are responsible for their own scope of work, for their own tasks. And uh, we always work remotely. 
So that's probably what is different from other teams, but we work remotely. So all our programmers, they stay in their own places, in their own countries, and we work, we don't have a central office at all. So all our teams, they work remotely and they communicate only electronically. So th that, that, that also helps us to stay away from this team idea and, and focus on individual results idea. That's first thing. The second one is over time. Traditionally, the, what's on the left is traditionally, what's on the right is our approach. So traditionally, uh, programmers are managed by stress in most cases. So we just know that uh, programmers in general, I mean, managers assume that programmers in general are kind of lazy. So the best way to manage them is to put the deadline as close as possible and then stress them so they work overtime, they work on the weekend, and that's how they will achieve better results. That's how they will be more or less under control. That's the only way bad managers can control people, is just to keep them under stress. And that's how programmers will do something. So we give them deadlines, we give them stress, and we get overtime. So they work more, they spend more, and we believe, and managers in general assume that if people stay overtime, if they stay in the office after the office is closed, these are the good programmers, these are the good developers who stay overtime, who spend more time in the office. In our case, it's quite the opposite. So we don't want programmers to work more, we want to work them less. We expect them to develop and to commit their code and to close their tasks and to close their tickets and to do anything voluntarily, only when they want to do that. So we allow our programmers to reject tasks if they don't want to do them, if they don't feel like it. So we just give them tasks and allow them to choose whether it's a good time for them to work on them or not, whether it's a good task for them or not, and whether it's a good time for them to, to, to do it now. And in most cases, in most projects, our programmers, when the project is full of work and we have a lot of tasks, they spend three, four hours a day for, for, for the development, not more. So we never work eight hours a day and forget the overtime. We don't have overtime at all. So three, four hours a day, it's, in my experience, it's the maximum time a good programmer can spend a day for actually productive work. And they do it voluntarily, because I'll, I'll say about it later, but because we pay for results, that's why they're really interested to do the work, because they get, you know, they get money for that. So they, they do it when they feel like it. Sometimes they commit a lot of time one week, and the next week they commit less time. So the graph jumps up and down. And it's not under control of the manager. The manager doesn't push the person, any developer, to any, to, to any amount of work. If we don't have enough you know, resources, if we don't have enough people to, to, to close all our tasks, then our managers have to find more people. Then we have to find more resources. I mean, developers, programmers, resources, whatever. So we find more of these resources, and it's a job of a manager how to, to you know, to find more, more resources and give that, give, give that task to that people. But we never stress programmers. We never expect them to work more than they want to. So it's a job of a manager. That's what I'm saying. So our managers are way more busy than traditional managers because they really have to do the management work. They don't need to, to stress anybody. They need to schedule tasks on the timeline. So we don't have ever overtimes at all. Number three um, is learnings. I'm, I'm going from, this, from, the, from the last critical to the more and more critical. So learnings. Traditionally, in a, any project which I've seen before, people, programmers, are the core uh, are the main holder of information and knowledge. So this is the most knowledgeable part of any project. This is the most important part of any project. If programmers know enough about the, the stuff they develop, then the project is more or less successful. The more they know, the more knowledgeable they are, the higher the chances of success. And if somebody, some, someone new, some new programmer joins the project, then it takes some time to ramp up that person to, to, to to, to, uh, you know, to teach that person the, all the new technologies and everything which is in the project. And it takes a month, it takes two months, and it takes sometimes three months. So it takes long enough to bring somebody new to the project. This is a traditional way. That's what we have in most projects. And in, in most cases, we have so-called experts, subject matter experts. So people who know most of, 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 the, of the, they, they possess the majority of the knowledge in the project. So they know a lot. And these people are the, the key decision makers in the project. If we lose that person in a traditional environment, if we lose that expert, we lose a lot. And that's why that people kind of start to control uh, the owners of the project. It's not the, the manager who controls the, 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 the development environment, it's the people, the experts who control people with the money. 
So they tell the customers what's going to happen. Not the customer says what's going to happen, but the people who are experts, they start to manipulate people with money. This is, the, this is what I've seen in a lot of places. We changed that completely. In our case, we don't really like the idea of having people who know too much in the project. We want, we want our artifacts, our documents, to know too much. We want our product to be self-explainable so that anybody tomorrow joins the project and, under, and can understand everything in just a few hours. It may sound crazy, but it really happens in our projects. We bring sometimes new programmers to the project which is one year old, and that new developer starts writing code and making new classes, writing new unit tests, committing code in just one hour. So it doesn't take a month or two months to learn because we don't have experts. We don't have people who know too much. We only have documents and source code and diagrams which explain everything. How we achieve that, we, first of all, we rotate people. We change people from project to project. We, we, we move them because we understand that the more experts we have, the bigger is the trouble for us. We don't want experts. We want people to uh, be, how to say it, like commodity programmers. So they're like, they can work here and then tomorrow they can work there. So they can go from project to project and can contribute there as effectively as they were contributing yesterday in a different project. So first of all, we we, I'll, I'll say a, lot, a, few, a few words about it later, but here we rotate them, we change them, and second, we, uh, we promote the idea of uh, uh, always blame the project, don't blame yourself. So if you start working in a project, you don't understand anything, you don't need to learn, you need to say that the project is not, is not sufficient enough for me to understand how it works. If you open the piece of code, if you look at it, you don't understand how it works, you don't learn it, you don't ask anybody, you don't find an expert. You just say, hey, your class or your piece of code is not clear enough, so fix it. And then we fix it for you, and then it will be easier for you to understand it later. So we always ask programmers to blame us, the project, for not being clear enough. And we fix that, we improve the, the quality of the documentation, and we bring it back to you and ask, can you fix it now? If you can't fix it now, then I claim you blame us. And then in a number of that cycles, eventually the project becomes as clear for you as it you, so you can understand it in half an hour. You'll probably have questions, we'll get back to it. <laughs> Number four, we have five in total. Number four, um, meetings. Traditionally, people believe that uh, the more programmers communicate, the more meetings they have, the higher the chances of success in the project. The, more, the closer they stay together, the, the more these face-to-face -face communications they have, the higher the chances that they will actually understand what's going on and they will produce something. So that's why we have these Slack chats, we have these Skype calls, we have conference calls. Sometimes the you, senior developers, they spend half of their day or maybe sometimes the full day in just meetings and just talkings and, and talkings and exchanging information. And this is what you know, managers believe is a good way to do. They think that senior developers have to be in that meeting. They have to spend time on talking instead of writing code. And, and even Agile Manifesto says so, like face-to-face -face communications is always better than documentation. We completely disagree with that. We believe that the more meetings you have, the more informal communications, the more of these chats you have, and the more face-to-face -face calls or whatever you call it, like you know, remote calls, doesn't matter. The more you have of that, the bigger the trouble you cause to the project because you exchange the information which stays nowhere. We talk to each other, I explain you how it works, you understand how it works, but tomorrow somebody else will join the project and that person will not know how it works. So we will have to explain again, we will have to explain again. So every minute spent in the meeting is the wasted money of the customer. So the more we talk, the more we exchange information informally, the more money we waste, which is customer is paying us. So good developers, I believe, and we like seriously preach this idea, the good developers, good engineers, they exchange information through documents, through, through diagrams, through the source code, through formal written communication, which is maintainable, which we can get back to in a year, in a month, in a week, in an hour, and understand why that decision was made, who made that decision, what was the reason behind that decision. To achieve that, to, you know, to enforce, not to enforce, but encourage people to actually use documents instead of calls, 
we don't allow them to call. <laughs> we just, <laughs> that's so easy. <laughs> we just, we just don't, <laughs> they just don't have phone numbers of each other. So uh, we don't have that Slack chats. We don't have that Skype calls. They don't know. I mean, they know each other, but only through, we work on GitHub. So they only know their GitHub accounts. All they can do in a project, if I don't know anything, for example, I joined the project and there are like 20 developers in there and I don't have some information. I can't call anybody. I can't ask anybody. All I can do is I can submit the ticket and say, hey, this piece of information is missing from that, that document. Can you please, you know, fix that and put that piece of information into that document? And somebody will fix that for me. I don't care who it's going to be. I don't care who's going to fix that. All I care about is that I look at the document and I find that missing piece of information. That's the idea. So if you allow programmers you know, to talk to each other, they will. If you allow them to call, they will, because it's naturally better for us you know, to communicate you know, face to face, just here's the, my friend sitting next to me. I'm gonna ask him, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna you know, get the document. I'm gonna just ask and get the information. We completely disallow that. For us it's easy because we work remotely, so all our developers are somewhere, they're like you know, in different countries and different time zones, so we don't have a central place. So we just keep them like that and we don't allow them to, you know, to get into some Slack chat and talk. All we can do is communicate through ticketing system and through the source code. And that's how we achieve that result. So we have only documents and only diagrams. And I'm saying it again, sometimes and it's very often we have projects which are one year old and the new developer jumps in and there's like 50,000 lines of code, of Java code, like serious Java code. And the new developer jumps in and starts writing code in just one hour. It's unachievable in a, traditional, in a traditional project configuration. The last one, and we have questions. Salaries, the biggest problem. So, tra <laughs> so traditionally, traditionally we believe that, I mean everybody believes that it's so important to keep the developer happy and to keep the developer safe and it's, you know, to, to, keep, to get the loyalty from the person. So we need long time, long term contracts uh, good salary, paid every month, and, uh, and that's how we're going to achieve, you know, good results from that particular person. So we usually pay for, well, not we, but you usually get paid for per month, per time, sometimes per hour, sometimes per month, but it's always for time. You just sit in front of the computer and you do something and they pay you for this time. You achieve the result, they pay you. You don't achieve the result, they still pay you. You work, you work, they pay you. You don't work, they still pay you. That's a huge problem, I believe, especially for A players. Remember that A, B, C players? We have A players, people who really want to achieve something, and we have C players who just enjoy being in front of the computer. So the A players, so the A players, they don't like that. They will leave your project and they will not be productive at all because this, uh, this format you know, puts everybody on the same level. Because if I'm the A player and I produce result, I'm still, you know, paid more or less at the same level as the C player who produces zero result. And then, and then there's soft skills. So then in the end, to make a decision who's gonna get more salary, who's gonna get a raise, who's gonna get the, you know, who's gonna get fired, we use soft skills. Who is the nicer guy in the team? Who talks more? Who is more communicative? Who is the good match for the team? That's how we decide who gets the raise instead of looking at the real results, instead of looking at the numbers, I don't know, not numbers, but, but the actual results that people provide. So we use the soft skills. It completely demotivates A players, in my experience. So we, we remove that. We don't have salaries at all. Well, we, we pay money, but we don't pay salaries. <laughs> we pay for results. Every time developers complete something, close the ticket, file a bug, uh, basically two things, close the ticket and file the bug. So fix the bug or file the bug. We pay for that. And we do micropayments. So we pay our developers in like really small micro micropayments. We can do that because we work with remote programmers and freelancers mostly. And, and we pay them through like PayPal, Bitcoin, whatever. So we just, you know, we have these transactions, many transactions every day. And the more they commit, the more they not commit, but the more results they produce. It's not about the number of lines of code. It's not about, the, it's not the, about uh, uh, some productivity metrics. It's about close the task or not close the task. Here's the problem. You either solve the problem or you don't solve the problem. When the problem is solved and we have small problems, we always have small tasks, half an hour, one hour, really micro tasks. 
The task is closed, we pay. The task is not closed, we don't pay. So there's no salaries. This is how we make it so easy to measure the performance and productivity and, and, and motivation of everybody in the project. Because we, I mean, we don't pay in the end of the month, we pay when the project, when the, when the task is, is closed. So I'm basically done. I think you will have questions, but let me summarize. So in this model of work, which I just explained, we've been working for about three years already. Uh, 250 developers went through this model. So 250 people actually tried that and get some money from us in, in, different, in different tasks and different projects. Mostly Java, 90% is Java. Uh, 25 projects completed, commercial and open source. We have open source projects at all, so you can look at them, come to me later, I'll give you my coordinates, you can look at the GitHub account and you will see a number of projects which were completed using this technology, this is this approach, and you will see how we communicate to each other in GitHub tickets. So you will see how we get rid of these meetings at all, and all our communications are there. So you will see even how we pay programmers, because all these like payment, you know, successful payment notifications are there in GitHub. So it will be quite interesting. And we produced about 300,000 lines of Java code. It's a pretty big amount of code. And all of these projects were really successful comparing to what I had before for many years. So I'm asking you to follow me, subscribe to the blog, and, and you will learn more. So now questions from you guys. So we have a plenty of questions in Slido. <laughs> and I will start with the most voted one, okay? And so, uh, you talk about information, uh, but what about designing together? Because the design is a, is a product of a conversation. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, I've heard that question many times. So people, again, again believe that the design is the, is the result of the conversation, of the, the work of the group. But um, in my experience, it's not that true. In my experience, the design is always the result of, of one person thinking and asking people around. So when we start a project, we always have some, some person as an architect in the role of the architect, and that person is responsible for creating the skeleton, the prototype of the product. That person may collect information from other people, asking, what do you think about this? I'm, I'm not sure about choosing the database, so tell me which database would you think I should use. Tell me about the technology I should use. So questions are welcome. The, the architect has to, have, has to ask questions. This is, this is perfect. But the final decision, the final design, has to be made by one person. That's what I believe in. They, we, we pay for answering questions, of course. But all questions are like tickets. So let's say, for example, you're a good database engineer, yeah? And I'm like an architect, and I don't really know what kind of database to choose. My SQL or Postgres. So I'm, I'm, so I'm submitting a ticket and saying, hey, I miss a comparison of my SQL and, and Postgres. I need a comparison provided for me. This is a task for you for an hour. So you work for an hour, give me a table, a spreadsheet, comparing why MySQL is better for us and why Postgres is better for us. And I say, thank you very much. I know that. Now let me make a decision. So that's how it should be. Iteratively go through questions and answers, and then finally I will be able to make my decision. Again, it's not easy. It's way easier to sit together in the same room and say, hey, what do you think about Postgres? And you say, well, MySQL is better. Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. And then I make a decision. But then in, in two months, somebody will come and say, hey, why the decision for MySQL was made? And I'm gone from the project because, you know, they fired me already. You're gone as well. <laughs> they fired you too. And then the question is, who made the decision? Well, there were two guys, you know. Yeah, I still have the phone number of the one guy. Let me call him. <laughs> But instead, we're going to have the, the detailed conversation and the ticket for that. And everybody will be able to jump in and see, yeah, that, that guy who is fired asked the question, why my SQL? And then another guy submitted a detailed explanation of that. <laughs> That's a perfect maintain traceability for that. My friends, there are so many questions in Slido. Go ahead and vote for questions. Because I'll, let's make it moderated, OK? And I'll ask the, the, the topmost questions. And there are many. So there's a, it's not a question. It's like a complaint. Three hours of work? Are you kidding? My manager will kill me, the stock will decrease, and the company will close. <laughs> For three hours of work? Three hours ah. of work? Are you kidding me? Yeah, per day. Yeah, I believe, honestly, that a productive, like a good engineer, well, I'm talking about myself, first of all, so I can imagine working for eight hours a day on something which is not my personal project, you know, which I really love. So working for somebody, for some project, for money, 
three, four hours a day is the total maximum a normal, you know, good engineer can, can really handle. I think so. Otherwise, it's eight hours and three, five hours of Facebook watching, you know, out of this eight hours. <laughs> so it's going to be three hours in, in, in any case. So you, you're not going to be productive for eight hours. It's not possible. You can really write code for three, sometimes even two hours is enough. But I think that in general, programmers have to be paid way better. So we need to earn way more. We need to make more money per hour and spend less time on, in front of the computer. You know? So I don't know how much you're making, but an average, like, say, for example, now programmers are making, like, first, I don't know, 25 euros an hour, 30, 30 euros an hour. They have to make 100, but work three times less. In this case, but the work three times less, but they have to be paid for result, not for the time. So now we're all paid for eight hours, you know, from the morning till the evening. Whatever I do, you pay me. But it should be the other way. It should be the opposite. You pay me way more, but only for the results I produce. In the end, it will be, it will be the same amount of money in cash, maybe a little bit more, but I will be focused on results. I'll be, fo I'll be really motivated and interested to, to, to actually work instead of just pretend that I'm working, just sitting there and just going to the okay. office. So, so three, hours is the, three hours is the maximum. Well, four. The next question. Who decides uh, how much time the problem, will, uh, the problem takes to solve? If it's the business, how can he estimate? They always think the task is easy. Well, uh, yeah, we, we just, in our, in our, in our approach, we, uh, we always give the same budget for all tasks. So we always give it a really small budget. And then we use this technology where we allow developers to return back the code in incomplete state. So I guess you're developers, right? Who are the developers who actually write code here? Like 75%, maybe more. So uh, you should understand that. Let's say you get a task for, uh, you have to implement that feature, and the feature is way bigger than one hour. So we don't ask you to, you know, to, we, we ask you to cheat, basically. We ask you to implement the high, provide the high-level implementation with certain parts not implemented yet. So we say this feature, for example, I have to be able to click the button and uh, log in. And this is one hour for you. And you understand that one hour is not enough. It should be like five hours. So you just create a button. It says log in. It's clickable, but it doesn't log in. So you just get, return back the code to me, to, to the master branch, and say the button is there, but there is a marker that says to do later, implement the login this and that way. So you kind of help us to, I mean, to design that, and in, by introducing the high-level solution and then keeping the markers of where other programmers have to contribute more. So you, re you return back the code with the markers, and then these markers we convert back to new tasks. So we ask developers to help us break down the problem into smaller pieces. That's how we do it. The next we call, question. We call it puzzle-driven development. So we call these pieces puzzles. Puzzle. So we give you the task, you, you return it back with puzzles inside. And then somebody else will solve that puzzle. And while that people will solve the puzzles, they will introduce new puzzles. So when we start developing, it's just a few puzzles. And then it goes like that. So there are like a hundred of puzzles. And then when all of them gets fixed, the software gets back and it starts to work. Well, it, it, it becomes completely functional. If you're interested, come back to me later. I'll explain. Next question. Isn't there a lack of quality? Developers deliver the code and go. There is no motivation in delivering good code. Who decides whether to pay or not? Yeah, it's a good question. So definitely. And we really, we really ask our developers to be lazy. So be lazy. Don't try to do more than you can do. But be prepared that the, the quality control is really strict in front of you. So when you get the task and you have to implement something, do as little as you can. You don't need to, you know, to, to make it high. Don't make the quality higher than the quality bar we have in front of you. And the quality bar is quite high. So for you to return back the code to us, to the master branch, it has to pass two code reviews plus the automated merge instrument. So we, we're going to merge your branch back to master branch only if all the tests and all the static analysis and all the coverage control, everything passes. So for example, I'll give you an example of how high is the quality bar for us. Static analysis is the, the step in the, build, in, in the build for us. So we don't, the build is not going to pass if the static analyzer says there are any bugs, any warnings, any complaints. You know what static analysis is, right? Do you, who, who doesn't know what static analysis is? Okay, good. So you understand that static analysis is usually is used as a tool which is, you know, which we run on the code 
which generates some you know, spreadsheets, some interesting web pages, which will look at and say, hey, the rate of our static analysis warnings is a bit lower than, than yesterday. That's great. But there's still a lot of them, still a lot of complaints. Look at your projects. Run the static analyzer for your project, no matter what language you're using. You will see there are many of them. In our case, there's zero. So we run the static analysis on the entire code base, and there should be zero warnings, which is really difficult to achieve if your, if your static analysis is configured properly. It's really difficult to achieve, especially if there are many people working there and the code base is quite big. In our case, no matter how big is the code base, no matter how, developer, how many developers are there, we're not going to merge your stuff unless there's no bugs, for, there's no static analysis complaints. So that's, that's an example of how high is the quality bar. So what I'm saying is that we're kind of building a conflict. Here's your task. You're going to get the money when it's merged. But you're not going to get merged if the quality is not high enough. And we do it for every single task. So for, in, for every single increment, for every single developer who is trying to change the code and, and commit the new stuff into our code base, into master, we always check the quality. We always check the quality. So when the project is one year old, we merged already a thousand pull requests. And for all these thousand pull requests, for thousand steps, micro increments, we check the quality again, again, and again, and again. So in the end, the quality is really high. Again, you can check our GitHub projects in Java. You will see how high quality, how high is the quality of our code. Okay, great. Uh, there was a comment. Uh, maybe you have something to say about it. Even prisoners are allowed one call. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, for the call. Yeah, I've heard that complaint a lot. So people saying like, hey, we're people. We love to call each other. We love to say good morning sometimes. What kind of work is that when there is like, yeah, people don't talk to each other? I, I also thought so. I had that fear years ago when I introduced that. I was like, hey, programmers not going to like it because they kind of used to, to talk to each other. They love this all these Slack chats and, and hashtags and everything. But when we're talking about A players, when we're talking about senior developers, they really don't like that. They like to stay focused on their stuff, which is really interesting for them. They have other places where, we can, where they can talk to somebody, they can you know, have beer, they can smile, they can joke. The, the work and the project is the place where people are interested in professional growth, not you know, interpersonal communications, in my experience. Because let's face the reality, the project is just a, it's just a temporary group of people who have nothing in common, basically, in most cases. They're, they're from different countries, they're from different cultures, they're from different, they're different ages, they're, they're just different people. They come together because they are Java experts, for example. And this is what they have in common. That's it. They're not friends, they've never been to school together, they, they don't live together, they don't have, you know, their, their families are not friends. So they want to focus on stuff which they have in common. And when traditional projects, you know, trying to make a team of them, trying to use these team building things, and trying to, you know, say like, hey, we're one family. They're not one family. They don't have anything in common. Like, you know, I'm, I'm 40, he's 16. What kind of family is this? <laughs> <laughs> and this is really annoying for A players. This is really annoying for senior developers to be in the team like that. When people are trying to put them together and say it's one family, one team, we're all together, they just leave me alone, let me code, let me you know, write the code, let me focus on that. We are doing exactly that. We're just saying remove that interpersonal you know, stuff and, <laughs> and focus on, this, on, on, the technical, on the technical problems. And people really appreciate it. A players, C players, yeah, they complain. They complain, they say like, hey, where's your Slack chat? How can I call you? I can explain you, let me call you. And I explain everything. We're just saying, no, here's the ticket, submit the ticket. You don't like the, the, the code, you don't like the documentation, submit the ticket. And he's like, eh, it's not really how I'm used to, um, to do that, let me call, it's easier for me. It's a clear indication that he's a C player, he or she. This is awesome, man, so le let's move on. If people are only paid for results, how do you handle periods where people have less productivity? They have personal issues, for example, but they are temporary. It's their own problems. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but we, we're adults. I mean, we, it's, it's business. So we, this is, we, pay, we pay people. I mean, our rates are high. That's first. So we pay people. We work remotely, and they're people from mostly from not really expensive countries. And we pay like 40 bucks an hour, $45 an hour. It's pretty high rate. So we allow them to make money while they, while, while they are productive, while they have time. So they are, you know, they should be smart enough, they should be grown up people 
to manage their own finance, to manage their own money. So save something for the time which for, for your vacation or whatever. So we're not trying to, you know, we're trying to respect our people, with our programmers. We're trying to treat them as, as you know, as equal. They're not, ch they're not kids, they're not children, so they don't need to be patronized like in traditional teams. Like, yeah, we're going to cover your vacation, just sit in the office. It's, it, again, it doesn't motivate A players. It motivates C players who don't like, hey, I'm productive now because it's luck. Maybe tomorrow I will stop being productive because who knows what's going to happen. They're afraid of that. And that's why they want to be patronized, protected. They want somebody to take care of them. We just let them care, take care of themselves. So we treat them equally. This is the project. We have money here. You produce something. You give the results. We transfer the money from here to here. And then we're, you know, just go our own ways. So okay. we don't have any you know, vacations, paid vacations, anything. Who is responsible for the final production result? Well, for the final production result is the architect. So technically, we have an architect, like I said, in any project. And that person is responsible for final production result. And responsible. We don't like the word responsible because uh, responsibility means some, you know, means that you're going to lose something if something happens. In our case, it doesn't happen. So in our case, if, if, if the project doesn't work in the end, then, you know, that's it. So there is no, you know, financial responsibility of that person. We're not going to say like, hey, now you're going to pay us something because you were the architect for a month and you didn't produce anything. So the word responsible in this case we don't like to use, even with the customers. So when customers come to us and say, like, hey, well, are you going to be responsible? Is it going to work? We say, no. We can't guarantee that the software will work. All we can guarantee that the way we manage the development is effective. It's like, it's, I'm always giving this example with the taxi driver. You go into the taxi and you ask, can you guarantee that you will take me to the airport? If the taxi driver is professional enough, he will say, like, no, I can't guarantee you that because anything may happen. The car may break, there's going to be a roadblock, whatever, anything can happen. All I can guarantee is that I have a GPS, I have a map, I have a driving license, I have the gas in my car, let's go. Let's go and see what happens. So we are together in this, in this journey, you know. The same should happen in software development. Any attempt to put responsibility on the, responsibility on the team, like say, hey guys, whatever happens, you have to make it work. It's just against the idea of software development, it's wrong. You shouldn't, well, as, if you as a, cast, as a customer, you shouldn't do it like that. You should, you should check how your team works, how effective are the mechanisms and methods they use to organize their work, and then see what happens. And also, it's it, it also related to the estimate. So sometimes people say, like, can you estimate the project? How much will it cost? We can estimate, but we never put that in the contract. We can give you some number and say, like, we estimate it's going to cost $100,000. Yes, that's an estimate. But it may be a million. Easy. So we just, we're just going to see what happens. We will drive. We're in the taxi. We will drive. But if on that way, straight there, if there will be some you know, uh, detours and some roadblocks, then we will make detours. And it will cost you more and more and more. The only thing we can guarantee is that we're not going to cheat. We're not going to you know, make extra detours. That's, that's what you can blame us for. But don't blame us for, you know, for the road being longer than you were expecting. That's the philosophy. I mean, not every customer will like that, but... Okay, let's move on. How do you know that your developers didn't form up hidden secret chat groups? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that your developers uh, does not form up a secret chat groups? Well, yeah, we thought about that. And, you know, when they start working, they, sometimes they try. Sometimes they try. <laughs> I had, it's a real story. I had a story with the customer. So the customer came to us, and I explained the idea, like how we work, how, and this, he said, like, I love it, let's do it your way. And then we started to work. And then in, in, in about a month, I realized that I don't have enough, you know, tickets. So, so he's coming to me and giving me some information, which I can't find in tickets. So he's saying, like, hey, we, we're using that technology, it's really great. And I'm like, yeah, but who made that decision? And he's like, yeah, that developer that made the decision. And I'm like, where? Where's the ticket? And he's like, uh, forget it, no problem, you already made it. And then I realized that he created the chat, the customer, <laughs> and invited developers there. And they started to talk there. And I'm like, and me and my managers were like watching in the tickets, and, and the, ticket, the amount of tickets go down, so the conversation stopped there. But the information, but the code is being written. So they write code, they make decisions, but we don't see what's going on. And then I, I, I talked to the customer and said, like, do you have some, you know, do they talk to them? And he's like, yeah, what's wrong with that? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> I told you, <laughs> that's completely against our, you know, our principles, our philosophy. And he's like, all right, all right, I promise you, no more talking. <laughs> and 
and then again the same. So he just, he just opened the box <laughs> and he ruined the whole thing. So in the end, the project failed. In the end, it was nowhere because we completely lost control of the situation. You know, you understand why. Because these people started to talk, they started to make decisions, and then, and then this, we completely lost control. That's it. So the project failed and quite, 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 and I told him, like this customer, I told him, like, look, I can't be responsible anymore for anything because you, you just, you're just doing things which are completely wrong. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't allow them to, to have that conversation. So it happened. Answering okay. the question, yes. So one more question. What stops me from generating the bugs I will fix for your money? What's, what happened? Uh, what stops me from yeah. generating the bugs that uh, will get fixed for your money? So basically... Ah, okay, yeah, that's a good question. So what stops the developer from generating, well, writing the code and introducing some bugs which will, which will be fixed later and then the developer will make more money, right? That's the question. Yeah. Well, first of all, we assign, bu we assign bugs to fix not to the same people who introduced them. So we randomly assign tickets. So let's say you're the developer. So you create a piece of code, and in that piece of code there are some bugs, intentionally made. Okay, you made them intentionally. But then these bugs will be fixed by that person, that person, and that person, randomly. So there's no real reason for the developer to introduce bugs. Like, there's no, I haven't seen that any, like, never. So, say again? Well, unless they have a secret chat, but... <laughs> But we assign tickets, so they don't make this decision. We always give them tickets. We say like, hey, Jeff, this is your ticket. You can't choose it. I mean, you can, you can say, no, give me that one. It's always randomly, only to, always to random people. That's how we actually solve the problem with no experts at all. So because every time we give, we give bugs and, and, and troubles to different people, so they, they always have to understand the new piece of code. So they always something in the code base, something new arrives to the, to the person, and, and, it, and it helps. So I haven't seen that. Okay, great. Uh, uh, another question. So how do you decide uh, how much do you pay for a particular task? Well, like I said, we always give the same, we send the same budget, let's say one hour. And one hour means multiplied by the hourly rate of the developer. So we have like a group of developers, let's say 20 people in the project, and that person is 50 bucks an hour, that person is 30 bucks an hour. So, and then we have a bug for one hour. So we randomly select the person and give it to that person. Okay, it's going to cost $50. Yeah, like I just explained before, so we just always say one hour. We don't know. We don't estimate. We don't care. So we just say one hour. Well, in our case, it's half an hour. We tried one hour, but now we, we use 30 minutes. So it's always half an hour. And we allow developer to cheat and return back the code, return back the fix, not completely fixed. So sometimes we have bugs which takes, I don't know, five, seven, ten steps. So let's say I create, there's a bug, I assign it to you, you fix it, not completely, you just say, hey, I just, for example, I introduced the unit test, which, which proves that this is not the problem. But I don't know what the problem is. So I introduce new unit test, and I put the new marker, saying like, hey, please investigate further, because it looks like here's the new unit test, but it doesn't prove that the bug is there. I return that code back. The new developer picks up the marker and tries again. Again, it can, uh, the, the developer can't do anything. Again, the new code comes into master branch. The new developer is assigned. The new developer is assigned. So we can jump back and forth, back and forth on these iterations, sometimes for 10 times. And eventually, that will be fixed. So the total cost of the bug will be 10 multiplied by 30 minutes. So it's going to be 300 minutes, the total budget. But it's going to be 10 increments, 10 increments with 10 people, which is a way more manageable situation comparing to one person, 300 hours, or 300 minutes. Hey, here's your task, work for 300 minutes, which means what, five hours. Maybe you will fix it. In our case, it's gonna be 10 people touching that problem, 10 people. Eventually, the, 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 the person number 10 will fix it. Which one is manageable, more manageable? Obviously, the, our approach. So we don't estimate, we just always say 30 minutes, half an hour, whatever you do, half an hour, do something, do something, do something. And then we iterate, iterate, iterate. Okay, great. Uh, what about ops? Um, no, what about operations and infrastructure? How do you pay for that? Well, for DevOps, uh, it's kind of something we, we haven't touched like seriously. So I'm not sure how, how it's going to work for DevOps, for the current situation with DevOps, where people actually, you know, configure servers and install something on servers. So my answer is I don't know. We'll try. We, we, we haven't touched that area yet. Maybe with the immutable servers, which I think is going to be the future, when we'll have immutable servers and then the entire infrastructure will be kept in the, in the repository as a code, 
and everything will happen in the code and then the infrastructure will be automatically deployed to production like in one click, then probably DevOps will be equal to developer and then the problem will be solved. But right now it's more like people with the SSH consoles, so it's difficult to do anything okay. like that. Uh, if the server is down, does Phaser Duty also just open a ticket? Well, in most, yeah, yeah, in most cases, if the server is down, we also open the ticket. We also open the ticket and say, hey, somebody fixed that. And, and, and then sometimes, it's a good question, sometimes we need that ticket to be fixed now instead of in five hours. In that case, we increase the budget. We just say it's not 30 minutes, it's two hours. Even though we understand it's a work for, for five minutes or 15 minutes, we just multiply, we boost the budget. We say, like, multiply. And it means like the developer will pick it up immediately and will try to do everything to close it because the budget is way higher. So we, can, we, we actually we motivate by money, which is a really good thing. So most people say that money is not a motivator. We completely disagree with that. Money is the greatest motivator. It's the, it's the greatest motivator ever invented in, in, in human history. We don't need anything else. We don't need these you know, tennis tables in the office. We don't need these coffee machines. We need money. Just give money to people in a clear way so that developers will understand why the money coming there, how to increase the amount of money. I don't need the soft skills. I don't, need to, I don't need to please my manager. I just need to close more tickets. This is, I think, a way more productive you know, approach to motivating people. There's a question here, maybe, yeah. Taxes. Well, we, we pay taxes, programmers pay taxes. So programmers, when they send money to programmers, they pay their own taxes, of course. Yeah, okay. yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, how much do you pay managers and how? Well, for managers we pay in the same, well, we also pay by task. And uh, so the more, the more tasks manager is managing, is assigning, closing, assigning, closing, the more money the manager gets. So we, we're always trying to attach everybody in the project for result. So the more the project produces, the more we deliver to the customer, more code, the more everybody, you know, gets. And the customers appreciate that, and we build them like that. So in the end of the, in the end of the, uh, of the of the week and of the months, we just show the customer the total amount of tasks we closed, bugs we solved, and this is the amount of money the customer pays us. Yeah. Okay. We have two more minutes. Who is breaking up uh, work in chunks? What if the chunk is too big? Well, I just explained that. I explained okay. that we, we just you know we just give the full chunk to developer, and then we allow developer to cheat. So that's how we break it. <laughs> Do you even have permanent employees in the company except yourself? Well, we, we, <laughs> I'm in general against permanent employment. I think it's a, it's a modern form, form of slavery. So this, this long-term employment is, com well, it's really good for, 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 lazy, for lazy developers. It's really, it's perfect. Because like I said, no matter what you do, you get the money. But it's not really good for people who are, you know, who are, uh, who are self-motivated, who are interested to grow, who, who wants to get pleasure from the work. So this full-time employment, long-term employment is really not productive. It's everywhere right now. All companies pay that and, you know, it's really difficult to, to, to fight against that. But I think the future is different. I think in the future we will get more money per hour, but we will we'll get paid for results. I think that's the future of professional development. Not what we have right now. What we have right now is, like I'm saying, it's modern slavery of the 21st century. It's going to go. Okay, and the last question from me, actually, to the audience. Yeah. How many people agree with this approach? <laughs> you see? 50%. That's a lot. <laughs> so thank you, Diego. That was awesome. Thank Thanks. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.